Hello and welcome to LCDC TV, the news channel for the London cab trade. Today, I will be revisiting and interviewing Jolian Morn, the man behind the Good Law Project and the instigator for getting Uber into court to pay the VAT. As many of us saw yesterday, Uber had increased their prices by 20%, adding the VAT onto all their fares, which should have happened years and years ago. But I'll be revisiting today. I'll be interviewing Jolian, seeing where we are, and thanking him on behalf of the cab trade. Let's go and see him, shall we? Taxi! Hello, uh, welcome back to LCDC TV. Today, you might recognize our guest, none other than Jolian Morm, QC, founder and director of the Good Law Project. Um, remember last year we was in your garden, wasn't we? I do remember that. I do remember that lovely sunny day coming back uh, at long last. <laughs> God, it's been a long winter. <laughs> Isn't it just? Listen, why are we here today? Well, it's obvious really. Yesterday, as everyone knows, Uber finally succumbed to putting the VAT onto their fares. Um, and the man responsible for that is Jolian, Jolian. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a real David and Goliath battle. And for me and other taxi drivers, we're like the little man. Uber was this massive global app that just come into a country and steamrolled everything, yeah? Many of us thought the game's finished. What are we gonna do? We had a regulator and a mayor that seemed to look the other way on everything. It was a real terrible point in our 365 year history. But then this white charger come up Fleet Street and on, I think it was the 20th of March, you took the, the, the Uber from your office to Uber's head office, asked for a receipt, 2020, 2017. That's right, it was almost exactly five years ago. Uh, we five years launched today, a, almost. five years today, launched a um, crowdfunding page uh by taking an uber uh with some journalists from itv to uber's offices which were then on aldgate yeah uh, and we handed over the uh, letter before action demanding a copy of the vat invoice uh and the trade really really got behind the litigation and we raised about 120 grand, I think, a little bit less than that in the space of four weeks. Well, that's when the club was seeing your tweets and the good law and the Uber thing. And, and that's when the club decided, we had a chat on the committee, it was one evening, and said it, you needed a certain amount to get it over the line by, it was a Friday evening, I think. I think it was. It was a Friday, and, and I was, okay, agree, it, send the money over, and we've done it. And I think it was the best money we've ever spent. Well, I know it is. Uh, I was really struck at the time by how many actions um, cabbies had supported. Uh, cabbies worried about Uber sort of flooding the market with, um, you know, uh, predatory priced um, uh, private hire vehicles. I don't want to say cabs, although, you know, fundamentally that's how they operate. Yeah. Uh, and driving the black cab out of the trade. It was never a level playing field because, you know, they didn't have to buy expensive um, black cabs. They didn't have to have um, disabled access in the way that black cabs do. Uh, they didn't have to uh, have the knowledge like black cab drivers do. do. So uh, the playing field was very, very tilted against um, the, the black cab trade right from the start. Mm. Um, and I thought that was pretty unfair. Because the point is, with Uber lobbyists from the beginning, uh, and even uh, the mayor at the time, Boris, it was all like, well, you know, you'll have to like it or lump it because this is called competition. You know, the fact that the cab trade from the private eye being licensed, I think back, we've had minicabs since like the 60s, 50s, 60s, we had competition. Uh, and I remember at the time when Uber really was devastating London, that argument, we was trying to say, look, we've had competition. What we can't live with is unfair competition. And we looked to our regulator, Transport for London. We looked at the mayor. 
and and it's well documented when when Boris said to me Grant we used to meet at City Hall the cab trade met with Boris every three months and he said look I'm, I'm really upset to tell you I'm not too upset he said but I, I've got to tell you this he said that I've had David on the phone Cameron and he said leave Uber alone now when you've got the the Prime Minister of this you know once great country lobbying on behalf of no more than a, an American minicab company for me that really sort of stopped me in my tracks because that was the enormity of the task i felt the cab trade was facing some people may not have seen it that big but for me i thought wow you can't get any more powerful than the prime minister telling the mayor of london no 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 more regulations for them let them go yeah although of course um you know uh, if boris johnson called up sadiq khan and told sadiq khan what to do i'm pretty sure sadiq khan would um, tell him where to get off um, it was always open to the mayor of london to do what he thought was best what he thought mm. the law required i mean i've seen that correspondence it begins with um, uber's representatives in san francisco lobbying uh, the British consulate in San Francisco, they get in touch with number 10. Uh, number 10 call Boris, and Boris calls off the dogs um, at Transport for London. Transport for London were all ready to act, uh, and they decided not to in consequence That's of that right. lobbying in, in San Francisco. And it was really, really grim. It was really, really clear to me as I read all of that correspondence how power actually worked. Mm. Uh, and you're absolutely right. You know, very, very difficult for um, the black cab trade to know how to fight back against that. Mm. And, and that's where we sort of really relied on having a strong regulator. Because if the public are, are using the app and the fares are, I don't know, two thirds of the price of a black cab and Transport for London are licensing them, so they must be all right because the regulator says they're all right. We was putting questions in even back then, Jolian, 2017, 2018, asking about the contracts, that they, the contracts weren't correct. The drivers were taking the bookings. Uh, you know, Uber must be the principal. They got to pay that. And for some reason, it was just coming up against a brick wall. The mayor office didn't want to know. Senior managers at Transport for London didn't want to know. Uh, there was uh, separate investigations. There was one, I believe, TfL legal team, Howard Carter and Garrett Emerson, the senior manager at TfL, actually said they'd done an investigation on the app and it was a price comparison app. So for the cab trade, we was trying to get sort of a proper legal opinion uh, and say, look, this is madness. You must see what we're seeing. And, and it, we was coming up blank all the time, which was a real worry for us. We, we didn't know where to go. But, and, and then you came along, Jolian. We were, I mean, I was a tax lawyer before I started Good Law Project. So I had um, an idea that this might be something useful that uh, I could start, Good Law Project could start by doing, was by using that specialist technical knowledge that I had about how um, VAT should work for Ubers following the employment tribunal decision mm. that Uber drivers were workers. If they, the drivers, were workers of Uber, they were supplying their services as drivers to Uber, which meant that they weren't supplying their services to passengers. So who was supplying services to passengers? Well, it could only be Uber. But if it was Uber, then Uber had Uber to charge VAT. Uber was the principal. Uber was the principal, Uber yeah. was the principal absolutely so. And, you know, all of these castles in the sky that Uber's um, clever, um, but not that clever, we now know, <laughs> uh, lawyers created, um, couldn't really disguise the reality on the ground, yep. uh, which was that Uber was the principal and yeah. should be charging VAT. Yeah. And um, I'll tell you what really, really is worrying at the moment, as you know, the country is in really dire straits financially. Uh, the day after Uber lost the, well, I don't think they did lose, lose but we'll get on to that, about the, the Part 8 declaration um, as principal. The next day, Uber tweeted out that they'd done a, a billion journeys since they're coming into the UK. Now, when you think of that and what you've achieved with the VAT, by Transport for London not regulating 
properly, in my opinion, and, and not taking action and listening to people like yourself and us saying, no, this is wrong. They must be out of payback. They must pay back. The country has missed out on a billion journeys where VAT hasn't been paid. How much is that? Hasn't so, been paid, hasn't been paid yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's pretty clear to me. It's a colossal figure. It's an enormous number. Um, I understand from journalists who have met Uber's chief exec, been given private briefings by Uber's chief exec, that the number then, and I think if I recall rightly, this was the sort of summer of 2019, was something like one and a half billion pounds of VAT that Uber um, was being faced with a collection of by HMRC. Of course, there'll be more in between the summer of uh, 2019 uh, and the beginning of March 2022. Uh, so, you know, we're talking a pretty substantial number mm. um, in the billions, mm. uh, undoubtedly. I think when, when everyone thinks that Uber lost that last court case, you know, in December, the Part 8 declaration, but I think, or we think at the club, what they'd done, they was already in the can for maybe paying VAT, but thought, why should we be the only ones paying it? So once the judge come down on that side that he did, it dragged every other private hire company into the same position. If they're gonna pay it, then so are Addison Lee, so are Bolt, so are you, so are you. It's got everyone over, isn't it? Well, that um, may well have been their intention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, Addison Lee um, were already charging their business customers VAT, um, but not cash customers. Uh, I mean, extraordinary to think that the question who is supplying the service um, depended on whether you paid cash or, or account for, for that service. It Absolutely bananas. No. Just explain really clearly um, how the whole analysis was always bananas. Mm. I mean, as, as, we're, as we're talking about now, it's all come into fruition where they're putting the VAT on, on it. They owe the, the, the big VAT bill, hopefully. Many people are saying to me what they've heard on the grapevine is Uber's going to turn around and other major private hire operators and say to HMRC, look, OK, hands up. We're paid the VAT that you're asking going forwards, but none of us are going to pay what we owe in the past. Do you think they've got a valid point on that, Jolian? Because they're saying if they have to pay the VAT, it could run into hundreds of thousands of pounds and shut the business. Well, um, HMRC's published guidance is very, very clear that they cannot accept less than the amount that is due. Uh, and we know from um, Uber's published accounts, published in London, but also published in New York, that they are in a dispute with HMRC relating to back that, if you like, historical that. Um, and it's a very substantial sum of money that they're fighting about. Uh, I mean, I've done some calculations in 2018. You can look at evidence that Uber's chief exec, um, certainly a senior Uber um, staffer, gave to a select committee in Parliament uh, about the average rates of earnings by Uber drivers and the number of drivers that they have from which you can calculate their sort of total market size in the UK, their turnover, uh, from which you can extrapolate VAT. And I did some calculations showing that the number was likely to be about 1.1 billion. So the 1.5 billion that Uber's chief exec briefed to uh, the journalist is pretty consistent. That was a little bit later in time. And although Uber's trade slumped, uh, as everyone's did in the pandemic, pandemic yeah. you would expect, you know, another billion to be a sort of reasonable estimate. And I think, I think the Telegraph has run with a two and a half billion pound number. Wow. And that feels to me about right. right. Um, uh, HMRC is said to have history of doing deals with the big sweet corporates, deals. sweetheart deals yeah. with Vodafone. So yeah. if you guys look at... Um, 
uh, HMRC and Vodafone, you'll see all sorts of suggestions of, of kind of collusion between HMRC and huge corporates. HMRC are very clear that they don't do that, and I'm very clear that they shouldn't do that. Yeah. But of course, um, I can't know that they won't do a deal. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is that the law is that they mustn't. When you look at the financial mess of the country, I mean, every penny that HMRC could and should draw back, you can't see an argument for, for any sweetener deals with major corporations at this moment in time, can you? Really? Well, you know, if you or I are investigated by the taxman, um, uh, we don't expect the taxman to say, well, looks to me like you owe me a thousand, but I'll settle for 400 because it would be uncomfortable for you to have to pay a thousand. Um, and I don't see why uh, big corporates should be entitled to a better treatment. No. The law is that they aren't entitled to a better treatment, and it would be good to learn that Uber isn't going to get a better treatment. Yes. But we may be waiting some time for that clarity. Wow. Well, there you have it. I mean, Jolian, today the cab trade has woken up, a main competitor in London. The fares have gone up 20%. I've been picking up people in my cab recently who say to me, quite honestly and openly, there's not a problem with that. Um, I used to use Uber, but the service is, is gone really down and their prices have gone up. So I'm back in a black cab, which, you know, is only great news for the, for the cab trade. And again, I'd like to just say, I know I've said it before, but this David and Goliath battle that the trade was in, Thanks to you, Jolian, and your actions, the Good Law Project and the great work that you're still doing on other, other projects, yeah? People look at the website, look at Jolian's Twitter, get involved. I mean, Jolian, on behalf of the cab trade, big thank you again. Thank you very, very much indeed. Oh, thanks, Grant. It's really, really nice to see you again. We've done this uh, journey, if you like, uh, for Can't. five years. Five so it's been years. a long, long time. So five it's really, years. really nice to get to the end of the road. Lovely. Thanks for watching.